Well, many thanks. Hopefully, I will not use all this slide. I think it will be more interesting to have a discussion afterwards. Um, so, first of all, I'm more happy to be here. And I remember, yeah, I remember that four years ago, we were having a discussion about ACTA. And uh, we're talking about uh, the risks for consumers, fundamental rights. We're talking about criminal sanctions, civil enforcement, damages. And it's quite funny, funny uh, that, again, we're talking, we're going to address some of the same issues. And I have the impression that we're always getting to the same point. It's always about um, the focus of policy making is always on more stronger uh, IPR enforcement. Uh, this is uh, the elephant in the room that whatever we discuss, uh, when the discussion comes to IP, uh, there is a divergence of views because a uh, civil society we want to promote a more constructive agenda to talk about uh, finding balance uh, in the current IP framework. And then on the other side, you have uh, negotiators, policy makers, policy makers who always put the IPR enforcement as a starting point. Um, and then we are in the post ACTA era, whether we like it or not. And at least Speaking uh, from the European side, there is a legitimacy <coughs> crisis of copyright law uh, in the post-ACTA uh, framework. Uh, ACTA was a strong, sent a strong signal to policymakers that they cannot continue with promoting an agenda based on longer and stronger uh, IP rules. Uh, it, was, it was also positive for civil society that there is a network in place, that uh, there is public awareness about the issue that can be used uh, when TTIP comes also to policymakers, at least in Europe, when they would have to approve it or not. And this is an issue that we always uh, highlight, that uh, there is the risk of eroding public support for IPR in general. There have been a number of studies by right holders trying to highlight the importance of IP for the European economy, uh, but no one is talking about uh, the other side. For example, uh, the industries in Europe who rely on copyright exceptions and limitations, they contribute, uh, the added value is almost 1 trillion euros to the European economy, but no one is talking about this. And I think also in the US with the fair, fair use, um, uh, the industries rely on fair use, they also contribute significantly. So there's a lot in the public debate, there's uh, a lot of misunderstanding, misinformation. And IP is about society as a whole. Uh, it's not only about right holders, it's about trying to balance the, in the interest of right holders with the interest of society and the public in general. That's why we have the exceptions and limitations. Uh, but no one is really talking about this. Uh, in the European side, for the last five years, we've been hearing about the reform of copyright exceptions and limitations, and there's nothing concrete. Uh, there are more and more reflection papers, communications coming out, but there's no ambition to actually put in place a fit for the digital environment copyright framework. And normally, when you talk about copyrights, I think everybody agrees that something needs to be done. And normally, in my innocent mind, first you try to fix the substantive law, and then you try to fix the enforcement. You do not start with enforcement. You do not try to enforce a law that is not good law. Uh, but here is the other way around. And then it's more of a blackmail. Uh, policymakers in Europe tell us, well, you know what? If you want reform of copyright law, you need to accept stronger enforcement, which still does not make sense. Uh, first, uh, if you want to promote more um, legitimate use of works, first you look at licensing, then you look at exceptions and limitations, and only then at enforcement. But here, I think that uh, policymakers do not really understand, do not have the same logic. Um, so coming uh, to the issue of um, uh, the, what I would like to focus on is, is uh, on the role of intermediaries and this through the encouragement of voluntary cooperation between right holders and intermediaries. I think that was one of the main issues that really um, killed ACTA. Uh, and I remember having discussion with the U.S. Uh, trade uh, people two years ago about the text of ACTA at that time. We were having discussion whether fundamental principles is the same as fundamental rights, and we're saying that it's not the same. And all this to say that transparency is key. We do not know what is being in the text, and details can make a big difference. And the issue of voluntary cooperation was one of the most uh, conflicting issues in ACTA. Uh, it's about um, shifting enforcement from public authorities to private entities, right holders, outside the rule of law. And I always make the, um, 
the comparison with uh, China, because the Chinese government, if they want to block content, they simply need to pick up the phone, call the network provider, block the con content, the content is blocked. And in Europe, who is supposed to be promoting fundamental rights, is about promoting the same system, uh, allowing the music industry, the film producers, uh, to simply notify uh, without any evidence or without robust evidence a network provider asking them to block the content. And this poses a number of, raises a number of uh, problems from the consumer perspective. Uh, first of all, it's a question of is this uh, proportionate and effective way of enforcing the law? Our answer is no, uh, simply because there are a number of fundamental rights, fundamental issues that are being um, uh, that are being affected. Uh, presumption of innocence is the first one. Uh, the right to due process. Uh, the right to confidentiality of communications. The right to privacy, which is a fundamental right in Europe. And what is interesting is that every year I have the impression that the same issue comes to the EU policy agenda, but through a different door. Uh, after ACTA, there was the IPR enforcement, because there is a framework for IPR enforcement in Europe. Uh, there was discussion about revising it, and then uh, they decided not to. And now they decided to create a, an amazing body, which is called the Observatory on IBR Infringements. So it's an observatory. It's supposed to be objective. I've been part of that observatory for four, four years now. Uh, I can tell you that it's something like 99 right holders and one or two um, civil society representatives. Um, at the beginning, the reports of the observatory were drafted by the right holders and they were approved with the stamp of the observatory and they would, be, they would become objective data. We've been fighting against that and now we managed to change a little bit the way it works. But uh, it's very dangerous that uh, a couple of months ago, uh, out of nowhere, uh, the observatory, the secretariat, uh, decided to make a report on voluntary measures for IPR enforcement. So the reaction from our side was really like, why are you doing this? And the answer was, don't worry, we're not going to do anything. We just want to know what is out there. So it's more like a mapping of voluntary schemes. But as you know, the moment you have a mapping of voluntary schemes, this is going to be used uh, in order to promote, also in the legal framework, more voluntary cooperation. And um, what is really positive, at least, in the European side, is the European Court of Justice, who is, who is engaged in some sort of judicial activism, and they've been significant rulings against um, disproportionate IPR enforcement. Uh, recently there was a ruling according to which the court said that blocking of content is not effective. Uh, filtering of co filtering is not effective either. There are significant implications, economic implications, who is going to bear the cost and it's always a consumer. Um, it's impossible to distinguish uh, between content. It's not possible for the network provider to know whether the content is in the public domain or whether content is uh, used is um, covered by uh, an exception. Uh, and still they have to filter every type of content and make decisions as to, the, uh, to its legal nature. Um, and then it's about creating a society of surveillance again because uh, they would have to monitor every type of every type of content, all types of communication, uh, and then it's a question of who has who is eligible to do that. Uh, normally, it should be a court, uh, should be a judge making decisions, and not a private entity. And speaking also to the network providers, they are afraid of litigation. So if they receive a notification by a right holder saying that this content is infringing my IP simply because I say so, uh, the network provider will always take the content down. Because if they don't, they will face litigation and they will have to pay huge damages uh, to the right holders. So more content will be taken down even if there is no legitimate reason to take it down. Uh, so all this uh, to say that the issue of IPR enforcement touches upon significant political, social uh, issues, fundamental rights that cannot be addressed uh, within the framework of the trade agreement. Uh, trade negotiators have not proven to be experts on those issues. Uh, they were the ones who negotiated ACTA, we saw what happened. So it's also our position that they should be very careful when it comes to IPR enforcement. And it's also an opportunity for civil society to play a little bit the game of ACTA, to use a little bit ACTA because it's good to remind people what happened with ACTA because the European Commission has been trying to, to 
uh, simplify the whole ACTA debate by saying that the problem was simply uh, that there was not effective public relations communication strategy from the right holders and this is why ACTA was misunderstood and that's why ACTA was rejected. And it's important to always highlight that it was not the reason. The reason was because there were people out on the streets that were concerned by the impact of IBR enforcement on the fundamental rights and freedoms. And it's always good to remind uh, the rationale behind that. Uh, so I think I will leave it there for the moment, and I'm sure that there will be more uh, issues in discussion. Great. Thank you. Thank you.